to the slides here. Here we go. All righty. So hopefully you're in the right classroom. Uh, today is October 15th, 2020, and this is our Empowering You webinar for Empower Missouri. Um, and today we're going to talk about uh, housing comes first, why we must solve our affordable housing crisis. Uh, again, my name is Sarah Owsley, and I am our policy and organizing manager. Um, that means uh, part of my uh, work is to lead our affordable housing coalition and to talk about uh, the affordable housing crisis across our um, before COVID-19 and during COVID-19. And we're going to talk about that some today with uh, a slate of excellent speakers, and I'm really looking forward to getting into that. Um, so today we're going to talk about that shortage um, and some policy actions that could help to alleviate it. Uh, we're going to talk about legislation uh, in Congress uh, for emergency housing relief during this pandemic, um, the connections between affordable, accessible, safe housing and health and mental health outcomes, and the CDC moratorium on evictions, um, and what tenants must do uh, in order to uh, really claim their rights in that regard. Um, if you're a social worker or uh, otherwise have some sort of other profession that will honor social work CEHs, you can receive an hour and a half worth of credit for today. Uh, please send Christine, our um, lovely uh, organizer on the, on the St. Louis side, excuse me, uh, an email at christine at empowermissouri.org. Uh, she does need your mailing address and the last four digits of your social security number, um, which you should be used to providing to us uh, when you signed in in person. Um, in order to issue that credit and, and we have permission to email it to you. So um, check in with Christine um, at the end today um, and we will take um, role so that we uh, are staying in line with everything that different uh, boards and accreditors uh, who have accepted uh, those CEH certificates. Um, finally, we'll have a link for an evaluation form uh, at the end of today's program and it would be very helpful to us if you would complete that link for us so that we know how, how we did today. Um, our first speaker uh, is gonna be Brooke Shipwright. She is the housing advocacy organizer for the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, she previously interned with the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia's Regional Housing Coordinator for the Self-Determination Housing Project of Pennsylvania. Um, she worked for Head Start and it's a, in a domestic violence shelter in Nebraska. Uh, she is an MSW. We really enjoy working with Brooke. Um, I'm glad to have a close relationship with her. She's been on many a shared screen lately, um, and we're really thankful to have her with us today. Um, after Brooke, we're going to have Markea Watson, the Acting Executive Director and Director of Programs at the Greater Kansas City Coalition in Homelessness. Um, she's originally from California um, and really regularly likes to remind me of that, especially when it snows here. Um, uh, also a social worker and a homeless advocate um, and is passionate about ending homelessness uh, across our state. And finally, Matt Appleman, an attorney and justice catalyst fellow at uh, Legal Services of Eastern Missouri. Um, he's a part of the housing attorneys um, at Legal Aid uh, who have been working to prevent evictions during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, he's been featured all kinds of places and we're glad to have a little bit of his time today um, and thankful that he's joining us. Before we get started with Brooke, I just want to provide a couple of um, basics. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard this 100 times, possibly even 10 times today, but um, just so that we all remember to mute and unmute yourself, you can click the icon of the microphone in the lower left of the screen or the mute or unmute button in the upper right of your own square, the picture um, of yourself uh, there. Um, we'll also ask that when our speakers are speaking, if you want to turn your camera off, um, that will help the streaming speed for other folks. Um, if you're on the telephone, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. Um, and um, if you will mute yourself when you're not speaking, that will improve uh, the sound quality for those of us who are speaking. Um, please post questions and links in the chat feature. Uh, it is very difficult for the person who is speaking to follow the chat box while they're speaking. Um, so that'll be my job or JMO's job. Some of us, uh, somebody will flag down that speaker at the end of their presentation um, and make sure that those questions get answered or we'll follow up with you if we run out of time. And finally, a recording of this webinar will be available on our website um, in the events tab. Uh, and please feel free to share that link um, with others. 
um, who might be interested in this topic as well. So we'll come back to that. Let's see here. So let me check the chat box real quick just to make sure none of that was me needing to know something here. All right, very good. So I think we're um, ready, Brooke. I saw you here. I'm going to pop in here. Do you have uh, slides to share? I'm sorry to. Yeah, uh, I, I do. No, that's OK. I just emailed them not that long ago, so I'm happy to share my screen. Um, perfect. Let me yeah. stop sharing mine. There you are. And you should right. have that ability, but let me know if you don't. OK, let's make sure I have a couple of PowerPoints pulled up for another presentation I'm doing. So let me make sure I get the right one. Are you seeing affordable housing in COVID-19? Yeah. yeah. OK, great. Um, well, thank you so much, Sarah, and to the whole Empower Missouri team. Um, it's really great to be with all of you today and uh, glad that each of you were able to join the discussion. Um, so like Sarah mentioned, I'm Brooke Shipwright and I'm a housing advocacy organizer at the National Low Income Housing Coalition or NLIHC as uh, we're often referred to as. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure to speak on a few of these webinars now in the last couple of years, but for anyone who isn't familiar with our work, I like to always just do a quick introduction of who we are. NLIHC is a national nonprofit dedicated solely to achieving socially just public policy that ensures people with the lowest incomes have decent, accessible, and affordable homes. Um, and we do this through nonpartisan research, policy, and advocacy work. And um, I think what makes us a little different are two things. One is the field team, which is the part of the, the group that I'm on and that we get to interact with people like you um, through various presentations and one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship building to connect what's happening on the ground in communities and what's happening here in DC. Um, and then the other piece is that we focus our work on the lowest income people because that's where our research shows the greatest need is. And right now, as a country, we're in a moment where now more than ever, our collective health depends on our ability to stay home, but many either don't have homes or at risk of losing theirs. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, pre-COVID-19, just touch on that very briefly, what housing looked like talk about where we're at with uh, the housing issues and COVID-19, and then talk about what's being done here in DC. So, um, like I said, uh, people are at risk of losing their homes or maybe don't currently have a home. This is what we call housing instability, and it is nothing new to the coronavirus pandemic. Before the onset of COVID-19, a quarter of all renter households are spending more than half of their income on rent e each month. And um, so that totals to about 11 million households. Now it's estimated with since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic that 30 to 40 million people in America could be at risk of eviction at the end of this year due to the current economic recession coupled with high numbers of job and wage loss. So for Missouri, just looking at the low end of this projection, 23 to 33% of renter households across the state are at risk of eviction by the end of 2020, a third of renters. Uh, this translates to up to 248,000 households or 570,000 people. And the CDC eviction moratorium, which some of you may have heard about, um, and I know we're going to get into a little bit more later on the call with one of our other speakers, um, but just briefly, it was issued last month. Um, you know, we were happy to see it. It was a long overdue and good first step, but it only postpones evictions. Without rental assistance, it's just a half measure. Um, like I said, it's important, but um, it, it only postpones eviction. So when the moratorium expires at the end of this year, back rent that people owe will be due and tens of millions of renters will be unable to pay without a robust investment from Congress um, towards emergency rental assistance. Um, I do, like I said, I know someone else is going to be talking about this, but I do just want to flag that we have um, an FAQ for renters and a declarative statement available on our website. 
that's translated into 14 other languages in addition to English. Um, so if you just go to the link on the screen, and I know the PowerPoint slides will be shared out later, so that will be available to you. Um, and I can also share it in the chat once I'm done speaking. Um, but if you go to that link and scroll down to what's next, um, you'll find these resources I just mentioned. So many of you probably already know the devastating impacts an eviction can have on families and individuals and that, you know, evictions disproportionately impact Black and Latino households. After an eviction, the likelihood of, of experiencing homelessness increases, physical and mental health are diminished, and the chance of gaining employment declines. And the effects are particularly damaging to children's educational development and well-being for years to come. We also know that an eviction crisis doesn't just harm renters, especially in the midst of a pandemic. The CDC made clear in its original order that evictions pose a direct threat to individual and public health. As low-income people lose their homes, their options narrow to doubling or tripling up with other families or seeking congregate shelter where it's hard to socially distance or isolate if they get sick. This undermines any community efforts to contain COVID-19. Many landlords who lack the credit or financial ability to cover rental payment arrears will struggle to pay their mortgages and property taxes and to main, keep, you know, keep up properties to maintain them and keep them safe um, and habitable. Without rental income to pay property taxes, communities, entire communities lose resources for public services. They lose resources for city and state governments, for their schools and infrastructure. Not to mention, um, if properties can't be maintained um, and landlords have to foreclose, we risk losing our already uh, low stock of affordable homes. So the resources provided in the CARES Act, which was passed last spring um, as a coronavirus relief package from Congress, it you know those dollars are helping many. Um, many of them have been uh, put forth towards emergency rental assistance, but it's far from enough. Our research shows that Congress must provide at least $100 billion, that's billion with a B, in emergency rental assistance to keep renters stably housed during and after the pandemic, and to ensure we don't lose any of our country's essential housing stock, like I was just mentioning. So we continue to push Congress to hurry up and pass legislation that includes the critical housing resources that were included in the House Passed Heroes Act back in May. These are $100 billion in emergency rental assistance, a national uniform eviction moratorium, $11.5 billion in emergency solutions grant funding to protect and house people experiencing homelessness, and an additional $13 billion in HUD and USDA, USDA housing programs so that they can continue serving the individuals and families that they already are, despite the drop in rental income that they're experiencing. We've seen an appetite grow for these priorities through people calling and emailing their members of Congress and having virtual meetings. Um, this appetite is growing uh, for all of these items, including some level of funding for emergency rental assistance on both sides of the aisle. But negotiations continue on an up and down roller coaster, um, starting and stopping. Uh, so where are we at now? Um, last week, we saw Congress and the White House go back and forth uh, with whether negoti negotiations were on or off again for the next relief package. Um, Last week, the House passed a $2.2 trillion proposal, which was a slimmed down version of the HEROES Act I just mentioned that has our key priority asks included in it. Um, they slimmed it down to a shorter time frame so that there would be room to potentially ask for more later on um, and to make it a smaller dollar amount to make it more uh, feasible to be passed uh, on the Republican side. Um, after a week of negotiations moving along, though slowly, President Trump tweeted that negotiation conversations should stop until after the election. The stock market then crashed after this tweet and the president quickly backtracked in a series of tweets saying negotiations should resume. 
Some conversations did resume, but they were limited in scope and focused only on support to airlines and small businesses, as well as additional stimulus checks. Um, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi insisted that more is needed. And on Friday, the White House floated a $1.8 trillion proposal, but both congressional Democrats and Republicans criticized it. It proposed to provide, um, just briefly I'll mention a few of the things, uh, $300 billion to state and local governments, $60 billion for rental and mortgage assistance, $400 a week in federal unemployment insurance into January, and $15 billion for food assistance. Um, it wouldn't include money to U.S. territories, has very limited support for tribes, and doesn't target resources to communities most impacted by the pandemic. Again, Speaker Pelosi said this was inadequate and Republicans said the price tag was too high. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has since said that the priority in these last couple of weeks um, leading up to the election will be to fill the Supreme Court vacancy uh, from uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing. Um, but he did say earlier this week that the Senate would vote next week on a quote unquote targeted relief package that would contain funding for the Paycheck Protection Program uh, that expired in August, uh, even though there are $130 billion unused. Um, it's unclear if anything else might be included in this targeted relief package and it's unlikely to pass the House um, regardless. So uh, <laughs> there is more work ahead. Uh, I know we've been beating this drum since, you know, April now, uh, but, it, you know, it's impossible to predict what might happen next. And I think the best use of our time is to keep making the case for the need. Um, we don't need to try to predict on what's, hap what's going to happen. Um, we've, like I mentioned, we've seen the, your calls and emails. Um, we had a virtual lobby day in July. We've been pushing people to call and email in the past several months, and we have seen the needle move. Um, so we know that it's working. We, and I know we're all exhausted, but when, when and how you can keep pushing, um, keep submitting traditional and social media, sharing the stories of real people being impacted in your communities and demanding that your members of Congress act on the housing provisions included in the HEROES Act. Uh, we at NLHC have a lot of resources available to make this as easy as possible. And I know Empower Missouri has um, things as well. Uh, so I can share the link to our um, email template and portal in the chat. And I know Empower Missouri has that available on their website. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that people have. Good. Thank you so much, Brooke. I really appreciate that. Um, I did want to go ahead and plug, I, Brooke had said something before too, that they have, um, NLHC has fact sheets about uh, the eviction moratorium, and they're available in a bunch of languages, like lots of them. Um, so if you serve a population or work with a population um, that might benefit from that, um, please check their website because it really is in a lot, um, um, available in a lot of languages. And I've appreciated, it's been sort of fun to see them kind of come through, so I've appreciated that. Uh, are there any questions for Brooke? I don't see any in the chat box. Okay, thank you. Well, I can, I have another webinar I have to hop on in about 20 minutes, but I can stick around if anyone has uh, questions you want to chat me on. Sure. Thank you so much, Sarah. Absolutely. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, Marke, are you ready? Uh, let me ask a question of Brooke real quick, and we'll see if I can get it in before the buzzing starts again. Um, you worked in a domestic violence shelter, and uh, Nancy Price has asked down in the chat box about whether domestic violence goes up uh, during uh coronavirus or this kind of a, a lockdown situation. Um, uh, I know that Missouri Kids First is, uh, or uh, Missouri, um, the other one, yeah, no, that's the right one. Missouri Kids First has expressed concerns that kids are away from mandatory reporters. Um, do you have some thoughts on, on uh, whether uh, domestic violence might be worse right now and, and resources that people could have? Yeah, I have heard um, from some of our partners uh, who focus on this issue. And 
I, I know towards the beginning, there were a lot of concerns that it would be going up. I know people have been um, receiving, you know, more phone calls. I think the, the concern, even if the, we aren't seeing numbers increasing um, of domestic violence, uh, the concern is that everyone's at home and there's not a safe time to call um, or to, you know, seek shelter, seek safety. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I, I think it is a major concern. And I think um, being aware of that when you're, you know, if, if anyone approaches you, I've, I've actually had that happen, not to say that this is a normal thing that happens, but if someone approaches you on the, the street and is in a crisis, you can work, you know, try to safety plan with them and connect them to um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, and I can provide that in the chat as well. Excellent. Thanks so much, Brooke. Mark Hamp? Hi, um, my name is Markea Watson. I am the interim executive director and as uh, Sarah pointed out, also the director of programs at the Greater Kansas City Coalition to End Homelessness. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit just kind of about the overall impacts of homelessness on a person's um, kind of sense of stability and well-being and certainly their health and behavioral health. But also um, I've peppered in a little bit of information about what these things look like in our community during the pandemic. Um, and this um, is also shared or will be shared on the Empower Missouri website if you'd like to access um, the slides later or get my contact information. Um, so first, uh, about my organization, GKCCEH is the Greater Kansas City Coalition to, Ed Hom to End Homelessness. We are the lead HUD continuum of care in Jackson and Wyandotte counties. Predominantly, we are the, um, the convener and responsible for the Petition that we refer to as the NOFA that comes from HUD every year for the continuum of care, which comprises approximately $14 million in federal funds to support programs um, for homeless associated work. We also work um, on a lot of data collecting and analytics around homelessness and support for those um, who are operating homeless programs. Um, so in 20 the last complete data set that we have this, um, nationwide. Uh, approximately 500,000 people experience homelessness on a given night. Census annually is taken within the last 10 days in January um, each year. Most communities do it um, every year. You're able to do it every other year should you elect to do so. In Kansas City, we do it um, once annually. So we've seen that um, nationally, the numbers have gradually inclined over, um, uh, over time since 2015. And locally, we've begun to observe in the last five, seven years that our numbers have at first decreased um, around 2013, 14, and then around 15 started to stabilize. And we've been kind of on a downward trajectory, but predominantly stable um, over the last couple of years. We identified um, in the 2020 census that 443 people were living um, in unsheltered situations in our community, but we know that that number is significantly higher and our, pro our providers estimate that there's more like a thousand people that they've identified by name who are living outdoors on any given night. We also know that the number of young people experiencing homelessness is an unknowable number and that hundreds of families that are experiencing homelessness are hiding right in our um, field of view. So as we all probably understand, homelessness is an incredibly complex problem. Predominantly, um, the thrust of what we're working on is, you know, that homelessness is caused by a lack of decent, affordable housing. Um, people are homeless because they're poor. I like to remind people that they're not homeless for other reasons. So there's a confluence of stuff that happens when people are in housing crisis, but predominantly they're in that situation because they don't have the money to dig themselves out. Oftentimes, people become homeless because of poorly managed health, um, behavioral or physical health, and inadequate access to health care. We also see that people um, experience um, homelessness due to unsafe social networks, or what we refer to as network impoverishment, meaning that they just don't have good, supportive, affirming people around them. And so when the rubber hits the road and things get difficult, they don't have that natural uh, support network to rely on. 
Also, folks experience homelessness as a result of violence, abuse, um, various forms of marginalization and trauma, and that can be within their family of origin, within their community, within their school. Um, there's a lot of places and ways that this shows up. And also what I refer to as the isms, um, so marginalization based on race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, and so on. I like to point out that youth are their own age cohort in homelessness, and we identify them to be people between the ages of 18 to 24 in HUD world. Um, and youth are definitely a different animal. Um, they're much more able to hide their homelessness than their adult counterparts. But the list of things that I've identified here actually come from the youth themselves in our community when we've engaged them in conversations about what um, predicated their homelessness. So often they report to us histories of trauma, violence, and abuse in the family of origin. Um, most of them report um, conditions like depression, anxiety, or some other form of mental illness. They also um, relate to us that they're very concerned that their mental health needs are not being met. They'd like to see um, services embedded in housing programs when they're able to access them. But just kind of overall, they report that there's gaps in their understanding about what mental health is, what it isn't, what the symptomology looks like, um, how they can access treatment and related services. And they identify that their behavioral health is often the cause um, of their eviction or housing instability. They also reported that they would like to have access to more resources um, to support their health care. And for many of them, their parents their, themselves. So these things also apply to their children. So um, as far as homelessness and health are concerned, I think that we all have begun to understand that housing and health are inextricably linked. We know that folks with severe and persistent mental illness are one of the largest cohorts or subpopulations within the homeless community. Um, and as many as 30% of people who are experiencing homelessness have some form of mental illness. Oftentimes, um, folks with mental illness are also comorbid with substance use and or trimorbid with behavioral health, substance use, and some form of physical disability or chronic health issue. And by comparison, um, we know, um, as reported by SAMHSA, that approximately 4.5% of the general population have these same issues with mental illness. Um, people who are mentally ill experience homelessness for much longer periods of time. So we know that within the first 14 days of a homeless episode, a person's capability to dig themselves out really shows up. And so after that two-week interval, surprisingly, that's when the homelessness really begins. And for some people, they're able to self-resolve. Many people who are homeless also have jobs or have some source of income. And so they might be able to, you know, be homeless for a couple weeks, go to shelter for a couple of weeks and then maybe shack up with a friend or a coworker and manage to self-resolve. Other folks, however, who become chronically homeless tend to experience homelessness for very long episodes, sometimes up to 20, 30, or even 40 years. People who are chronically homeless are also much more prone to what we consider catastrophic health crises and catastrophic behavioral health crises and are certainly far more likely to find themselves incarcerated over time. Um, in short, um, homelessness and housing instability diminishes people's um, capabilities, their um, life chances, um, and their potential. I put in here a quote um, from one of our neighbors in Kansas City that um, relayed to us that they're not looking for um, a handout from us, but they really do want um, help out of their situation so that they can get onto self-sufficiency. Um, so as I mentioned, homelessness um, just in general is catastrophic for people's health. We see all sorts of health outcomes, um, disparate health outcomes like the um, frequency of diabetes, um, co-occurring with substance use, um, a lot of profound mental health conditions, um, things like amputations, hypertension, um, just a lot of health stuff that we see with folks who are living on the street. The other thing that it's important to recognize is that when a, when a person, in particular, when they're living outdoors, um, you know, my, Maslow's hierarchy really does come into play here and their survival or um, access to the things that they need for daily living becomes much more of their primary or predominant focus, making other things like going to school or getting a new job seem impossible or unattainable. 
They're also subject to further stigma, violence, discrimination, and criminalization. And so once they're in a homeless episode, there are actually people who prey upon homeless people and they're um, discriminated from entering public spaces, even to use the bathroom um, and to do um, you know, activities of daily living. There are increased use of substance misuse, as well as a reliance on high-risk survival strategies like using drugs to stay awake, trading sex for food or a place to stay. Um, and, you know, homelessness is expensive. It's much more expensive than housing. And this applies to the person or persons that are experiencing it, as well as the community at large. Um, black and brown folks, as well as those who identify on the LGBTQ plus spectrum, are disproportionately impacted. Um, and we see that folks representing these communities or cultures represent 40 to 50, sometimes 60 or 70 percent of the homeless population. Um, and as was mentioned before, um, homelessness is extremely disruptive for children. And many of the chronically homeless adults that we identify when we're engaging folks on the street actually came from within the child welfare system or from families that had been homeless um, in the past. And the longer a person experiences homelessness, the harder it is to get out. So during the pandemic, we've noticed that um, people who were formerly homeless and then had gotten housed through our housing programs have really begun to struggle. And so all of the isolation and fear and anxiety about COVID-19 that all of us are experiencing um, affects them as well. They're um, not able to access their resources like therapy, case management, groups, um, counseling. Um, they've also suffered job income loss. There's an increased prevalence of substance use and certainly um, much more family and intimate partner violence is happening um, in the pandemic. Having limited access to phone, Wi-Fi, um, internet, being able to get on Facebook or chat with friends online um, has really impacted their mental health. And then we've seen a lot of food insecurity, increased risk of eviction, and people are starting to return to homelessness, some of whom had been stable for a long time, um, in some instances, years. And we've also seen that families who did used to come to the emergency um, response system to get their needs met and had gone away are starting to return. Um, so through COVID-19, we know that it's, there's a potential for maybe 40% um, inflow of new people into the homeless system. Um, I will note that the homeless system is already a system that's pushed far beyond its capacity, and we simply cannot afford a 40% increase of people. Um, we certainly have an inadequate supply of safe, affordable, dignified housing in Kansas City. We're working on strategies to engage landlords, but we know that we've got to start, turn a corner um, from our reliance on private landlords and start thinking more broadly about how to create housing opportunities. Um, we've identified that people's health and behavioral health needs are complex and there is no turnkey solution. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's a prevalence of family, sexual and gender-based violence. So people in the community, um, in the homeless sector and uh, adjacent to the homeless sector, are working on um, taking some steps to uh, address the health disparities and kind of some of the limited chances that folks that are emerging from homelessness or who are still living um, in shelter or on the streets are experiencing. So we want to ensure that people are getting um, adequate and um, seamless connections to health care. Our clients have told us that if we house them and they don't have access to behavioral health, then we're wasting our time and wasting our money. They already know that they're going to fall out of housing if they don't have their medication or they don't have therapy. Um, as a system, we're really looking at racial equity and essentially all forms of structural violence, racism, and oppression to identify how we as a system are perpetuating this violence against people and what we can do to address it. We're working on um, uh, targeting our resources toward partnering um, in a really truly authentic way with people who have lived expertise. I would like to point out that we are starting to adopt the terminology expertise rather than experience. Um, and so that's to be noted here. We'd like to see people get swifter connections to employment. Um, we know, as I mentioned before, that people are homeless because of poverty. And so we can't necessarily adjust the threshold for their standard of living, but we can help our people to get to the standard. 
um, by creating job opportunities, training programs, and other educational opportunities. We're um, starting to do street-based services, um, which is kind of new and different for Kansas City. So rather than compelling folks who might feel unsafe um, to step into an agency door to seek um, help with their medication or to seek treatment, we're actually starting to provide those things in an outdoor setting. So a person can have um, access to therapy or case management in the woods where they are. Um, we're looking at families and trying to identify and engage families who are predominantly living in their vehicles. We're seeing a huge upsurge of um, uh, family homelessness. And one of my grave concerns is amongst these families, you know, how are their children going to edu um, um, seek education? How are they going to access the internet and keep up with their classes? And so we're looking at means of doing that um, um, in, an, in an outdoor setting. And then collaborating more deeply with what we call feeder systems, so the child welfare system, criminal justice system, um, and healthcare system, where people kind of vacillate in and out of those systems into homelessness in a cyclical manner. And then really emphasizing moving on strategies, which involve um, other types of subsidies for housing to move folks on uh, to self-sufficiency so that we can create more space in the homeless system. Whew, that was 15 minutes exactly. <laughs> On the nose. <laughs> I appreciate your time. Does anyone have any questions? True professionalism, Mark. Just like well honed. <laughs> uh, I have a question. This is um, Ingrid Burnett. And I, I just am curious when you talked about the things when you said we are doing these things, um, that last list of uh, initiatives or, or action steps it looked like, um, what, what, it, what does that look like in terms of we, who is that and how is that being coordinated? So the organization that I work for is the lead agency for the continuum of care of homeless providers. It's approximately 100 agencies, some of whom um, provide housing and related services. Some are connected to education or healthcare. And so we work um, ongoing in a collaborative manner to attack some of these challenges. And so like the connections to healthcare, we're working with um, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City, Truman Behavioral Health, Rediscover, Comprehensive, those providers, Wyandotte Inc. on the Wyandotte side, um, to ensure that as we're able to engage people on the street, that we're also able to get them connected to supportive services um, from within the healthcare system as immediately as possible. And then I've recently begun um, working in partnership with uh, KU Medical Center, their Strawberry Hill campus, to identify and triage people who are in behavioral health crisis who also have housing issues so that we can start to engage them into the homeless system from the healthcare system. So these partnerships are kind of the most obvious um, thing and the most obvious need, but there haven't been really formal arrangements around it. And so our community of continuum of care providers is working on um, making those connections. Um, as far as racial equity um, and things that are kind of more systemic and I think less palpable but less visible, those are some of the mandates that come to us from the federal government that we start to examine. And so as the lead agency and lead coordinating and convening body, we do a lot of research, quite rigorous research, bring in um, experts from the field from other places to do trainings and technical assistance around these topics to help our providers to understand how um, these these issues impact their programming and what they can do to kind of level up the services that they're offering and to be more intentional and mindful about those kind of issues. Um, as one, I'm sorry. Oh, and then as far as um, anything that's related to street level engagement or partnering with people who are currently experiencing homelessness, 
again, those are collaborative efforts that are underway in partnership with our shelter system. Um, we have quite a few people. Actually, we've since COVID-19 began, we've got a really great and robust um, street level team that's going out three times a week into the community. Um, I go out with those folks on Tuesday evening and it's a really wonderful group. Some of them are volunteers, some of them are from the school system, the cops. We have um, the fire department. Um, there's all sorts of partners that are at the table um, and actually working with people in the field. And I will say um, that's one of my greatest joys. All of this academic stuff is, you know, is lovely, but really um, working with people in the field and working um, in collaboration with such a broad kind of group of providers is really, really great. Is it possible to um, participate or to come and be a part of that? I'll, and I'll, I'll just preface this with the district that I represent is very overrepresented with street people. And uh, I'm curious how much engagement is happening with the people who live in those neighborhoods uh, where, this is, uh, where this is occurring. Um, because I think there, uh, there's a, um, an impact to them that is beyond just the community, um, but to the to the actual neighborhoods. Um, they they are really overstressed and and they don't have the resources either. This is happening in poor communities, um, and and so the toll that it's taking on them. Um, is significant. And um, I, I have a strong interest in finding out if there's a way that we can bridge getting the, the, serv the needed services to the people who need them in a way that also doesn't impinge upon the folks who are barely, you know, would be there, but for um, very, um, close circumstances. So Ingrid, I live two blocks away from you. Yes. On Skerritt. I am one of your constituents. Oh, very and, good. Yeah. And um, this is one of, so it's kind of an occupational hazard, I think, for me living in Northeast, because I spend a lot of time doing street outreach there, whether I'm on the clock or otherwise. But our headquarters where we, um, all of our outreach efforts begin is at Hope Faith, which is um, right up the street from you and I. And we spend a lot of time on Independence Avenue and in that general vicinity, working with folks who are living in the parks and congregating there. Um, there's, as you know, a lot of trafficking happening on the Ave. And so we're really, we spend a lot of time in that part of town, but we're also starting to see that there's a lot of sprawl of unsheltered homelessness. So when we're going out in the River Market, the West Bottoms, that kind of area, we're seeing that people are vacating those spaces and starting to show up more in Midtown, the Eastern side of Kansas City, um, and now a lot more around Swope Park. And so we have an outreach map that we've developed that has approximately 100 camps that we've identified and color coded based on the activity that's going on in those camps. And we work one by one um, with each of those encampments to identify who's in charge and what we can do to support. But I will say because of the amount of sexual trafficking that's happening on Independence Avenue, um, that's one of our predominant focus areas. I would love to talk with you at a, at a, um, at a later date offline um, because it's something, I mean, for us where you and I live, it's so, it's on the front of your thoughts all the time because every time you drive home, you see just all kinds of craziness happening. Um, and so I would absolutely love to talk to you about it. Uh, can my course now would be the time someone <laughs> rings the doorbell and the dog goes crazy, but uh, can I, I'll just send you my uh, phone number and we can hook up. Absolutely. Um, okay. Absolutely. All right. I, I will do that through the chat. I'll, I'll just send it to you privately. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hello. And, uh, this and, uh, is... oh, sorry, Wayne. We had one question in the box and then in the chat box here, and then hopefully we'll have Go. enough time to get to your question too there, Wayne. Um, Emma said, uh, could you talk a little bit more about the reentry housing landscape or housing resources upon reentry in Kansas City? 
uh, can formerly incarcerated people access COC services if they were not unhoused before incarceration, but are at risk of being unhoused after reentry? So the short answer is no. Um, there's a lot of nuance to the homeless definitions as HUD has stipulated, but if a person, it's not necessarily about their housing situation prior to incarceration. If they were incarcerated doing what we call long time, if they're in jail for fewer than 90 days, that's a different story. But when I think of incarceration, I think of prison. And so what really defines their homelessness is whether they are street or shelter homeless upon exit from incarceration. And in many instances, you're not able to exit on probation or parole if you don't have a place to land. And so people are kind of in this weird kind of gray area. We know that many people do end up on the street and just use their auntie's address or whatever. But as far as HUD is concerned, you have to be able to document that they had a homeless experience post exit from incarceration to be eligible. That does not mean that there aren't housing programs um, dedicated to people who are in this um, returning citizen population but they're fewer um, than the general population. And then the other thing that really is a huge issue is folks who are on the sex offender registry, their housing options are extremely limited and increasingly so um, in these times. Thank you. That's right. Wayne, go right ahead, we have three minutes. Okay, uh, real a real quick question. One of the things that we're seeing in the field that's, that's just scaring me to death is that the LIHTC, Low Income Housing Tax Credit, Missouri Housing Development Commission properties, uh, many of them are starting to age out of the program. Uh, the, 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 the projection right now for Kansas City is in the next five years, 7,500 people living in these affordable housing are going to probably be put into homelessness because of the fact that all the subsidy programs will end and these, and these uh, housing uh, programs will go to market rate. We're already seeing it happen. Um, we, we know where they are. We know who runs them. We could certainly be asking them, are you going to go mark market rate at the end of your of your uh, uh, obligation to MHDC, um, we're already seeing some people being kicked out of their housing. Uh, that's not fair. They're not kicked out. They're priced out of their housing in St. Louis. And um, what we're what we're going to do if we're not on top of this and start having some discussions is that you're in the Kansas City area alone. You're you you got you're lining up for 7,500 people that are going to be thrown into the streets because there's no other housing. They're going to take, it's, it's just a bad situation. It's going to get worse. And I don't understand why we can't get MHDC since they're just now putting out their request for proposals for this coming year. Uh, shouldn't we be asking them, why don't we rebuild in areas where properties are going to be taken offline and brought to market rate. This is going to sneak up on, on us nationally. It's about 2 million, but Missouri's got a ton of them. I'll stop there. Thank you. Marke, you unmuted and then muted yourself again. Oh gosh, thank you. Um, thank you for your comment, Wayne. And I actually would really like to talk to you about this because I'm, I'm curious to know which project models you're talking about because it's always been my understanding that, well, I should say that the LIHTC projects or providers that I work with are um, supportive housing providers and that subsidy is supposed to be ongoing for the duration of time that the person needs it. And so I really would like to talk to you about that because I think, and I feel like you and I have kind of had some of this conversation before, but about affordability in general, we're not just looking at LIHTC, we're, I mean, where Ingrid and I live is becoming an area where it used to be affordable and our people cannot afford to live there any longer, you know? So I think we're in an affordability crisis just across the board, well, yeah. but I certainly, think, sorry. oh, I was gonna say, certainly any subsidized programs, we would like to know and identify who they are and better understand um, the, the terrain that you're describing. Thank you. Uh, 
I, 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 I will. What's happening is that basically there's a 25 to 30 year uh, obligation for a developer to maintain housing at an affordable level. And these are wonderful housing units. However, those first set of them are now going offline and every year there'll be more of them meeting their 25 and 30 and we're not replacing them. We're building stuff somewhere else and in the process creating a homeless mess. But I'll stop because there's more important things to speak here. Uh, I'll send you a note. I'll send you a note and we'll get together. Perfect. Wayne. Thank you. We do have one more speaker. Um, I just wanted to quickly plug. They, in Prowl, Missouri, wouldn't pay me what they pay me if I didn't say that. These are conversations that are ongoing with our um, Affordable Housing Coalition. We meet once a month. Um, on the second Monday of every month at uh, two o'clock. And this is a, the kind of conversation that we continue to have. Uh, we work closely with partners to help um, reinstate the LIHTC statewide match um, with a transparent scoring process. That was a pretty significant win for us um, and will help some of the further development um, of affordable housing. But um, certainly those units rolling offline are a really important thing that we definitely need to be watching. And I appreciate that. Matt, are you ready for us? I definitely am. Um, should I share my screen for the slides or is that something that you all have the ability to do? I, I do not have your screen. Okay. I, do, I do not have your slides. So if you'd like to share them, sure. that'd be great. Wonderful. I'll go ahead and do that then. Thank you. Absolutely. And while I'm doing that, I'll say that um, I'm Matt Ampleman. I'm a staff attorney and Justice Catalyst Fellow with the uh, Legal Services of Eastern Missouri. Legal Services is the largest legal aid organization in the state of Missouri. We serve 21 counties um, from Washington and Jefferson counties all the way up through the Missouri-Iowa border. Let me maximize this. And Okay, um, and, um, and then my uh, part of this organization, I work with the Neighborhood Vacancy Initiative, and we are a group that works with place-based organizations to acquire vacant problem properties and then repair them to create affordable housing in high vacancy neighborhoods. Uh, but we at Legal Services have an all hands on deck approach, and we are in a crisis, which is why I've begun to work on the CDC order and some of the other national protections that have come out to help tenants in this moment. It's really more of a year or two years of crisis. Um, and the CDC, in their words, is the nation's health protection agency. They save lives and protect people from health, safety, and security threats. Why did they decide to wade into the housing world? Uh, well, it's for the reasons that uh, Markea and Brooke have told us. There's a very, very tight link between housing and health. And the CDC specifically found that eviction moratoria can be an effective public health measure to prevent the spread of communicable diseases, including COVID. And they have very, very detailed findings within the order itself. So for anybody who's interested in gathering additional um, peer-reviewed information and the best science possible on this link between homelessness, housing, and health, I highly recommend you take a very close look at the CDC order and the Federal Register publication preceding the order. Um, but we also know at this moment in time, a month and a half later, that the coronavirus threat is only increasing as we approach winter, unfortunately. And it's, it's really everywhere. It's in every county in the US and in Missouri, we see it uh, thriving most in our rural counties, but it's also still obviously very, very present in St. Louis and Kansas City in our other metropolitan and micropolitan areas. So it makes sense that we have a national order that covers every jurisdiction um, and that focuses on keeping people in their homes. Uh, because we do expect, unfortunately, we expect this trajectory to worsen. We expect that as winter comes and uh, homeless persons are forced into congregate settings and individuals socialize more indoors, that COVID will spread more and that individuals will only be more vulnerable to um, displacement and exposure to the virus because they've been evicted from their homes. So I know that many of folks on the call today, on the webinar today, are very aware of the CDC order. 
but it bears mentioning again um, the, the plain takeaway of the order, and that's if a tenant delivers a CDC-provided declaration or a very similar one to their landlord, the landlord cannot evict the tenant until after December 31st, unless the landlord is seeking to evict the tenant for one of five covered reasons. Um, that's a very important caveat. There are a couple other caveats that is really important to keep in mind as well. The tenant must pay as much rent as they are able, and late fees and interest and other charges still apply. Those will accrue and they will be due in January of 2021. So we at Legal Services have been advising all of our clients who are seeking to use the CDC declaration that they pay very close attention to that caveat, that they pay as much rent as they are able to because that helps them avoid a situation come January 2021 where they have an insurmountable amount of late fees and interest that's accumulated and that all of a sudden is due. Um, I'm going to come back to some additional requirements and limitations of the order, uh, but first I want to um, talk a, a little bit about recent developments in what this order means for most people. Um, and the great thing is that when the order first came out, um, it was a, a very bold statement, and the order itself still is a very bold statement um, on what landlords can and can't do. Um, the order defined evict and eviction to mean any action by a landlord, uh, owner of, of a residential property, or other person with a legal right to pursue eviction or possessory action. Uh, so again, any action by those people to remove or to cause the removal of a covered person from a residential property. This definition is really powerful because it's not acquiring a writ of eviction or um, affecting and serving that writ of eviction. Um, it's any action taken to remove or cause to remove a covered person. So when this order came out, advocates across the country were focusing on this definition, um, us at Legal Services included, and telling everybody involved, everybody who had an interest in this order, that the order covers um, filing an action in court, filing an eviction action in court, providing a notice to a tenant that they must vacate the premises, um, attempting to acquire a judgment from a court that somebody has violated a rent and possession statute, attempting to acquire a writ of eviction or attempting to serve that writ of eviction, that any of those actions were covered. Um, and that's, again, the very clear language of the order, which is very important for tenants because as we know, if a landlord files an eviction action, that goes on a record that future landlords and any individual that might be interested in providing you housing has access to, and that can create a stigma for tenants that is very difficult to overcome. Um, unfortunately, this past Friday, not surprisingly, the um, CDC um, undercut its original very strong statement about what was prohibited under that September 4th order. Uh, so it released an FAQ last Friday um, that's non-binding, but really influential. Uh, and I'm sure it's been circulated among many, many landlords and many courts. And what that FAQ says that's different from the original order is that landlords are allowed to file eviction actions and they are allowed to continue prosecuting those eviction actions up until the very, very final step of executing the writ of eviction of actually evicting the person. Um, so while we're glad that people are still protected from eviction itself, there are many steps along the way that still cause harm to tenants and are likely to cause them to leave their housing, not really voluntarily. If a landlord comes and waves a judgment in your face, says, I have a court judgment. It's still not a writ of eviction, but it's a judgment that says, I am entitled to these premises a lot of tenants are gonna heed that warning and leave and they're still going to be effectively evicted. Um, so we're very, very upset about that outcome. Um, and we're also concerned that the FAQ uh, clarifies that landlords can challenge these declarations in court. Um, and that could potentially have a very chilling effect on people who are 
saying very specific things that they are vulnerable to becoming homeless if they're evicted. And if they're required to sit down in front of a judge and state why and be questioned about why they are going to be homeless, um, it could very well be traumatizing to many individuals. So we think that this really could have a very chilling effect. Um, it contradicts the original order and the original order has the effect of law. The FAQ does not have the effect of law. But again, we expect that landlords and courts have circulated this document and will treat it as if it is the law. Um, and we also expect that any potential prosecutor, um, any potential federal prosecutor that could have sought to use these actions against landlords, there are very, very steep fines and fees in the CDC order. We expect that those prosecutors won't be going after anybody who takes these actions that the FAQ allows. Um, so for that reason, the FAQ is somewhat a de facto law in this instance, although it was not vetted um, and released under the same conditions that an actual order would have been. So what does this mean for tenants? Um, I spent the last few slides explaining to you all why we're concerned about this development that came out last Friday. Um, but I don't want to um, gloss over the real benefits that the CDC order still has. Um, and the takeaway is still, you cannot be evicted if you have delivered this declaration. And it's a true declaration if you've delivered it to your landlord. Um, and that period of an eviction pause goes through December 31st. So let's remind ourselves of what the order requires because this is still very important to many, many tenants. Um, so the requirements of the order are that individuals deliver a declaration to the landlord, um, a CDC provided declaration or a very similar one. Um, these individuals seeking to avail themselves of the CDC order must also make their best efforts to obtain governmental rent assistance. Best efforts is kind of a squishy term, uh, but we've been advising our clients, do as much as you can. Call, apply, um, and if an agency that's distributing CARES Act money, for, assist, for example, says you're not eligible, then that's, you've done your due diligence, you've made your best efforts. Um, but again, that's quite a squishy term. Um, tenants must also continue to pay as much rent as they are able. Um, that's important for two reasons, as I said before. You're not protected unless you do that, number one. And number two, it's best if tenants avoid the liability, a huge amount of financial liability come January 2021. And lastly, um, tenants should get all persons who are on the lease to sign the declaration. If they don't, they're still vulnerable. The declaration itself has many very specific requirements. Individuals um, must meet the requirements from the previous slide and they must uh, declare that they do under penalty of perjury. They must also have an income that's under $99,000 a year or $198,000 a year for joint filers. Um, there are some other qualifying um, possibilities if individuals have above that income. For example, if they received a stimulus check um, or if they weren't required to report any income in 2019. Anybody who files a declaration must also be unable to pay rent due to one of two reasons. Either there's been a substantial loss of household income or they've had an unreimbursed medical expense, and that means something above 7.5% of their adjusted gross income. Uh, and very importantly, if evicted, they would likely, not certainly, but likely become homeless, move in with others, or live in a homeless shelter because they don't have access to other housing that would be less expensive than the housing they currently live in. Um, and again, they must continue to pay as much rent as possible, and they must declare that they are going to. There are some important caveats. As I've mentioned, rent is still due, late fees and interest will accumulate, they will be due in 2021. Residents can still be evicted for one of five reasons, engaging in criminal activity, threatening the health or safety of other residents, damaging or posing an immediate and significant risk uh, to property, violating any applicable building code, health ordinance, et cetera, and violating any other contractual obligation. So violating any other term in their lease other than those related to payment. Um, so I wanna take a step back. Um, 
maybe I should pause a little bit and I'm going to scan through the chat to see if there are any questions about um, the CDC order itself. Um, and while I do that, I'm also going to transition to talk a little bit about what's been happening in our communities before and after the CDC order. Um, I know in Kansas City, um, there have been judicial interpretations of the CDC order that we believe aren't faithful to the order itself and that the ACLU is challenging. We're really excited about that. Um, in particular, the 16th Circuit's uh, administrative order about the CDC order only gives tenants seven days to challenge a filing by their landlord that says no declaration has been filed. And there's nothing in the CDC order about a seven day window. And it's really unrealistic to think that tenants would be able to respond to a court filing within seven days. Um, so for those reasons, uh, we cheer on the ACLU in their suit in the Western District of Missouri. Um, I, I see that there are a couple questions here. There's a question from Kelly Berry. Are there any agencies in Kansas City who still have CARES Act dollars for rent assistance? Um, I don't know if anybody on the line has an answer to that. Is anybody aware of that? I know in St. Louis, it's hard to find that information because the money has been distributed amongst many different organizations. Is it the same way in Kansas City? The problem also is, Matt, that the, it comes in in different ways. So the way, so not only was it distributed through different organizations, but it came in different through different uh, funding streams. So um, I recommended to Kelly and, and to others in the Kansas City area to apply at kcrelief.org. Um, I believe that there are still housing organizations that have some CARES dollars left um, for rental assistance, and I think that's probably the fastest way to get assistance. Uh, Markea had to hop off for another meeting, um, and so I think that's probably the best way for that. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, well, then briefly, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what's happening with illegal lockouts in St. Louis, and unfortunately, um, we can kind of think about evictions and the housing crisis as somewhat of a, a hydraulic system, if you will, meaning um, um, like water, if you apply pressure in one area, um, then there's the possibility of leaks elsewhere, especially when you have landlords who are busy trying to uh, crack, crack open the pipes. Um, so we have, um, unfortunately, many ways that individuals are evicted despite legal protections that are available to them. And probably the worst of them is illegal lockouts and self-help evictions where landlords take the law into their own hands and they're not allowed to do that anywhere in the state of Missouri. It's a reason they call them illegal lockouts. However, if there's no enforcement of the laws preventing landlords from taking um, the situation into their own hands, and we expect that landlords will continue to do that. And we know that they have increased in the St. Louis area. My colleague, Rob Swearingen, has paid very close attention to this. He spends a lot of time litigating these cases, trying to get uh, damages for tenants who have been illegally locked out uh, because their lives have been turned upside down. Um, thankfully, in St. Louis City, illegal lockouts can result in criminal penalties for landlords who take the law into their own hands. We had hoped to get a similar ordinance in nearby jurisdictions in the St. Louis area, but success, success there has so far been elusive. And again, um, these ordinances are only so um, effective or only as effective um, as law enforcement treats them. If law enforcement is not aware of these illegal lockout ordinances or the general statute, or if they choose not to enforce them, then um, that really doesn't provide tenants too much help, except for after the fact, if they wanna call a legal aid organization and sue their landlord. But again, that, doesn't, that can't um, undo the harm that they suffered in being illegally locked out. Um, so for that reason, public education is key for tenants for landlords, for law enforcement, and our agency is going to continue to do that. Um, and then just one more big picture thought about what's happened with the CDC order. It's been very uh, upsetting to see the CDC undercut what was originally a very strong order. Um, and we're still going to spread the word as much as possible because really 
only the people that know about the CDC order are able to avail themselves of its protections. Um, so we're doing the best we can to get the word out there. Um, but it's been a, a very real education into the many ways that um, landlords and government agencies um, and other actors shape an environment where landlords really always have the upper hand. And even though there might be a statute or law um, or a ruling that comes out that seems very favorable to tenants, we have to continue to fight to make sure that it's applied in a way that actually achieves justice. So I appreciate those of you that are on the webinar today that are continuing to do that in your communities. And I think I'm going to scroll through the chat again to see if there are any questions, but I think we can provide some space here in the webinar for people to ask questions over audio as well. Thank you so much for your presentation. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I don't want to miss anything in the chat, so I hope if anybody has a question, they'll... And I see, I see that... Um, Yell it out. I see that Jeanette posted the link Maybe. to the... Oh, sorry about that. I see that Jeanette posted the link to the St. Louis City Ordinance. Uh, I know that Jeanette worked on that particular ordinance, so thank you for your successful advocacy there. Um, I see a question from Isabel. Can you check with the city and county to see what CARES Act funds they have are available? I can check with my colleagues. Um, oh, it says you can check. Yes, yes, yes. Um, definitely please reach out to the top, to those jurisdictions themselves, um, because you may have to call a lot of organizations before you find one that has funds. So if you start at the top, um, they should be able to tell you. Um, Cynthia Miller says that she was told that Jefferson County did not apply for any rental assistance dollars through the CARES Act. I do believe that that's true, Cynthia. Um, I, many, many jurisdictions received CARES Act money and they had to decide how they were going to use that. And so if they did not make that affirmative decision, then they wouldn't have CARES Act rental assistance as a default. So I thought that there was actually rental assistance that, that came through Jefferson County through CARES Act. Um, so I um, offered that she might email me and I'm happy to sort of track that down one way or another and find a definitive answer. Perfect. But Thank you, Sarah, for correcting yeah, me there. Possibly more right than I am. I hope that you are right. So. <laughs> yes. I. It was a time period where we were sort of all of us all over the state talking about how important rental assistance was going to be. Um, and we continue to sort of talk about, we really need to be investing more heavily in rental assistance. Um, Matt, if you wanna stop sharing your page, I'll go ahead and share um, my screen. Actually, I might just be able to over, I forget that I have that power sometimes. And we can go over various policies currently. Um, so robust federal pandemic relief, um, speaking of that need for rental assistance, we need more food and housing assistance and we need it now. We need to stop waiting. Uh, we've been waiting months and months that we have been saying that this is critical that it happen as quickly as possible and that continues to be more and more true every day that we wait. Um, we make it very easy to reach out to Senators Blunt and Holly, uh, who we believe are the contacts for Missouri. Um, and if you just hop onto our website, empowermissouri.org, we have a pop-up that comes up and tells you exactly how to do it uh, and gives you very easy language to use. Um, we do want you to go ahead and edit that, if you can, into your own words, um, because we think that that's more powerful when it's your own words, but it gives you sort of an outline of um, what to ask for and how to ask. Um, you can also sign up to receive uh, more information and, and hear more about those things um, from Empower Missouri at the Take Action link. There we go. Uh, we also think it's very important that everybody gets out and votes uh, on November 3rd or that you do plan to do so early. Um, if possible, either in person, by mail, there's lots of ways to vote. Um, unfortunately, it's a little more complicated in Missouri than it really needs to be. Um, so we really urge you to 
find the way that's most convenient and easiest for you and to follow up. Um, I'll let all of you know that I uh, have already mailed in my ballot. I wanted to make sure that it happened early, but I did not have to worry about uh, the Postal Service getting overridden um, or uh, very busy. Uh, and I wanted it to, I, I wanted to be able to feel better about sort of shutting out the news <laughs> as we got closer and closer to time. So uh, I went ahead and filled my ballot out early and got it in the mail quickly. Um, but uh, it's important that you, uh, since it's a little different than you just show up at your local elementary school or whatever, as it may have been for many of you for years, um, uh, and that you avail yourself of options uh, if you don't feel safe voting in person uh, on November 3rd. Uh, I am one of those people that did not want to vote on, in person on November 3rd, so I requested um, a mail-in ballot early and got it in the mail um, early. Uh, as a reminder, if you need to get uh, your ballot notarized, you can go to the Secretary of State's website and there will be lists of free notaries that will um, be happy to, they've all volunteered to sign your ballot for you, notarize your ballot um, if you need that. Um, so please make sure that you have a plan um, to make your ballot uh, count to make sure and get it in. Um, the cool thing that's on this ballot uh, is the amendment three. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I really research what I vote for, and I'm really not very happy to be voting on the same thing again. Uh, I think there are likely people on the call that feel the same way today. Um, amendment three is sort of a trick uh, to get us to take back something that we really meant. Um, so we hope that you will vote no on Amendment 3. And here is some of the information about how this was written uh, to trick people. Uh, banning lobbyist gifts seems like a really great idea until you remember that we just voted to change them to $5. So now you're just making it so now we can't even buy coffee for a lawmaker. Uh, if we chose to, that would be the very most that a lobbyist could do at this point. Um, or reducing legislative can campaign uh, contribution. Um, again, that's sort of a trick. Um, and um, changing the redistricting process, uh, which is really what they're trying to, to um, trick you into here. They sort of changed those, that language around um, a whole bunch of times. Um, uh, we really want to make sure that we're counting our full population um, as we decide who uh, so we hope that you will join us in working to defeat Amendment 3. If you are interested in going one step further than voting no on 3 and you'd like to find information, have information, um, please uh, follow us uh, at EmpowerMissouri.org. Um, we have lots of opportunities to do that with some of our partners. Um, and either Jamie or I would be happy to connect you with folks. Uh, in November, oh, I have a little bit of feedback from somebody, so I'll ask if you're not speaking if you could mute your line. I'd appreciate it. You can hit star six or hit the mute button there. Thank you for being willing to So we'll keep going here. <laughs> uh, November 20th, we're going to have a racial equity summit. It is online. Uh, with Reverend Dr. Darcy Wilson, um, a thought leader in racial justice, community organizing, and movement building. Um, he is the uh, current CEO of the Beaconess Foundation in St. Louis, and um, will be moving to the Children's Defense Fund um, in Washington, D.C. Um, we hope that you will register and join us for that day. Also, we're looking for uh, attendance that day will be free. We're also looking for sponsors if you're interested in um, helping to sponsor the work that uh, we do at Empower Missouri um, or helping to sponsor that important summit. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to really come together after the election and continue to talk about the good work um, that will be needed moving forward. And here are some of our, um, what are we calling them? Some Platinum level, there we go. Platinum level for the Racial Equity Summit. Uh, Maxine Clark and Bob Fox uh, and the Deaconess Foundation. We certainly appreciate their support. Looking forward to that event. You can find more information at Missouri.org. Um, and here's some more information about 
um, more things that we've got coming at Empower Missouri. We've got all sorts of things happening now and in the future. Um, this is our uh, St. Louis chapters and Kansas City chapters joint um, collaboration forum online. Uh, if you're interested in that topic, you can find out some more information on October 16th at noon. You can register for that on our website. Again, attend. Um, and some more uh, dates about our coalitions and promissory beliefs in the power of coalition and working together collaboratively. Um, and here are some of the ways that we do that with our affordable housing, smart sentencing, HIV justice, and food security coalition. And here are some opportunities to join us in those. Um, again, shockingly, more information will be found at our website. Um, thank you so much. Hopefully one of those chat box alerts um, was the uh, evaluation link from JMO. Um, if not, we'll make sure and have that for you uh, available quickly. Again, my name is Sarah Owsley. You can find my email there, sarah at empowermissouri.org. Uh, JMO, who is your regular host, um, but will soon be enjoying their new deck, um, is, uh, can be reached at Jeanette at empowermissouri.org. Uh, we thank you so much for your time today. Um, is there anything else before we let you all go? We have grab the chat box and make sure. There we go, some more information about where you can find no on three campaign, cleanmissouri.org. All right, excellent. Thank you everybody for your time. We appreciate it. We're here if you need us, thanks.